I'm Christina Rea, and welcome to Breaking Out of Breaking In, a practical filmmaking podcast about taking your creative career into your own hands and making great work that gets seen without playing the Hollywood game. Or at least while changing the rules. Hi, I'm Brie Castellini, your other co-host, and today we are breaking down writer's block and its d- light side of the moon inspiration. <laughs> if you'd like to suggest an upcoming topic, send us a compliment, ask us a question, or otherwise get in touch, you can hit us up, as always, on Twitter or Instagram, at BreakingOutPod, or via email, BreakingOutOfBreakingInPod at gmail.com. And if you want deeper dives into everything we cover on this podcast, this time uh, I think we've got some like fun writing prompts and some exercises to do not all physical exercises but like things to do to try and like generate inspiration and break out of writer's block uh subscribe to our patreon at patreon.com slash breaking out pod and if you've been paying attention to the feed i imagine that you've seen that the month of september when this episode is going live we are doing a little pledge drive that we're calling breaking even because we Mm -hmm. love making this podcast But we spend money to make it (laughs) and we would love to break even so that we can focus on it even more and bring more stuff to the the table. On National Podcast Day, which is September 30th, we're going to be doing a live stream that's going to be an AMA for 30 minutes. And we want to do a a celebratory live stream to kind of Mm -hmm. talk about stuff, to check in with our patrons. It's going to be Patreon exclusive. So the only way you can get access is through the Patreon. And um, relatedly, the only way that you can decide what we do with our time and how much time we actually stream is by pledging because we've broken it down and the amount of money that we need to raise between now and September 30th to break even and, and cover all of our podcasting expenses is every increment, we will add a half hour to our live stream and then our patrons will get to vote on that. So, you know, mm-hmm. it might be a, a cooking class with Christina. It might be a and a Bob Ross class with me, um, <laughs> resident Van Gogh. Yeah, it might be, you know, something silly. It might be something educational. We don't know. You will have to help us decide on that. So if you want okay. to hang out with us, if you want to get access to all of our pre-existing and future Patreon content, if you want to be a part of this fun party and determine what is the shape of that party, then help us break even during this month of September 2021. It's uh, patreon.com slash breaking out pod if you want to see what your options are. That's right. And if you subscribe at any level, even the $1 a month level, you get to vote and you get to tune in to this celebration. But we also have a special offer going for the month. Mm, that's <laughs> at true. At the $5 level, you get a personalized meow video from one of my cats, whichever one you choose, a doodle from Brie, a personalized doodle from Brie. It will and- be something very weird so don't worry <laughs> if you're if you're like is this going to be some normie nonsense like like a smile and a flower like no it's going to be aggressively bizarre so you're welcome <laughs> in advance and we're also offering a, a short consultation with either of us mm-hmm. one time um, and you also get the things that are usually at the five dollar level Mm -hmm. Which includes a holographic sticker, I believe. Um, And for those of you who are already subscribed at either the $1 or $3 level, upgrading your pledge to $5 gets you access to all of this stuff. That's right. All right, so let's get into our actual topic of this episode. Well, I mean, (laughs) what inspires me is not spending money to make something. (laughs) Haha. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this this week we thought we'd kind of we we'd do sort of one of our half craft, half just craft discussions episodes on the concepts mm-hmm. of of writer's block and inspiration. So I think that we should just start with like a an actual just general check-in of each other since we are both writers and both on that that hamster wheel, which we talked about recently. Christina, yeah. how are you feeling writing wise lately? So the entire beginning of the pandemic, like, you know, last spring into, I would say, early fall, I was not feeling inspired to write at all. Mm -hmm. It was, it was really hard. (laughs) Um, And then I quit my job. (laughs) And that, uh, and I was definitely experiencing burnout, like around the time of quitting my job. And so writing was like, not on my mind at all. Mm -hmm. And then when I started to see on the horizon, like some more time on my hands to do what I really want to do with my life and what I love doing. And 
when I started to, I mean, the pandemic is ongoing, but it started to look more hopeful too, because we were talking vaccines and all of that. I, I started writing again. And, and really what kicked it off for me was a specific staffing position that I had to submit samples for back in October. And since then, I've been trying to write more consistently, and I've definitely been better at it way more than I was a year ago. <laughs> but <laughs> But uh, it's still it's still hard. I I'm going to talk about my weekly writing group later in the episode. But that was something we did very consistently for like three or four years. Every week we would have a meetup in person. We stopped doing it in like May of 2020 and only started doing it again just now um, in summer of 2021. And even though we're back to it, we're not as consistent because they're both still working full time. Kelsey and Ryan are the two people that are always in it with me. And they're d- definitely in burnout of like their full time job during mm-hmm. a pandemic, working from home, no boundaries, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I haven't had the like spark that I usually get from that, but I've been trying to find it myself and we, and we can talk more about that throughout the episode. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm doing better. I'm writing a little bit, but uh, not quite to the degree that I would like to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The pandemic, you know, do you remember like the, the King Lear stuff from the beginning? Like Shakespeare wrote King Lear during his quarantine. Oh my God. Yeah. Absolutely. Fuck off. He wasn't a gig worker doing webinars all hours of the night. Shakespeare was basically a layabout as far as I am concerned. (laughs) Right. So yeah, now my, my current status is I think in a similar place. I, I had an initial sort of burst of like you know, writing, because for the first time in many years, I wasn't constantly thinking about how to get back into production, like what my Mm -hmm. next thing was going to be, because I physically couldn't be in production. And I had already kind of at the beginning of 2020, decided that that was going to be a big writing year for me. So I was already on a trajectory when the world shut down. And I was like, well, I guess, you know, circumstances are a little worse now, but they match up to what I was already planning on doing this year. So that was the period, the early period of the pandemic was when um, my a uh, creative partner, Christine Cherry, and I, we did like a little session where we broke Sam and Pat season three. We, t- I don't think she's written anything. I wrote the first episode of what would be season three in like an initial burst of excitement and then just sort of like fell off of it. And we had a couple of like development sessions for another project we were doing. And then we did write the quarantine special of Sam and Pat are depressed mm-hmm. because like we were both in virtual therapy and you know, we, uh, Christine had just come out and she was like, not just in therapy, but like also like going through her transition. And mm-hmm. so we loved love Sam and Pat and we wanted there to be a version of it out there with Chris living as herself. So we, in addition to having a lot of thoughts about virtual therapy, wanting to do something or whatever, like we did that. And then that was like the last thing that I truly wrote until 2021. Most of 2020, I wrote like a single eight minute script. (laughs) That was it. Mm -hmm. And I felt terrible. And I was so burnt out. And like, I think we're doing an episode on burnout in a couple of months. So I'll I'll talk about that more specifically then. But like, I... I was at the end of my rope. I had nothing left. I just like, I would work, I would eat and I would fall asleep. And that was it. And then I moved away from New York, blessedly, no offense, a little bit of offense (laughs) and was in Colorado for a couple of months in 2021, which you guys probably know because I mentioned it on the feed. And I finally got back into the swing of like, having natural light and feeling like a person who was alive again. And that Mm -hmm. helped a lot. And also this year being like, so last year was supposed to be the writing year. This year was supposed to be the like submitting to contests. And I was like, well, just because I haven't written anything yet doesn't mean that I have nothing to submit to contests. So this year has been a big focus of like trying to build up new samples because a lot of my samples were sort of random. Like they didn't pair well for fellowship applications. So I was like, all right, Mm -hmm. I need to write at least two or three things that like can work together as a package for me in addition Mm -hmm. to just being good samples of my writing. And so that's what I've been focusing on this year. Early in the year, I wrote a new pilot that I'm really excited about. Now I had just finished a first draft of a new pilot that 
the concept I'm excited about, but the actual script is just like horrendously boring. <laughs> so I don't, I, I'm, I'm working through that right now, but I am writing. And a big thing for me has, um, you have your writer's group. I don't have mm-hmm. that yet, although I'm trying to find one right now. But for me, what I've done is I used to, when I was still going to therapy, I had a block of time every Thursday morning where I wasn't working because I had to like commute to and from therapy. And then when we went remote for the pandemic, I didn't have my commute anymore, but I decided to keep that block of time off of my calendar just because like you know you can't just go straight from like having a very emotional like vulnerable moment with your therapist and then like answer a work email it's the the commute was a very necessary part of that and then when I stopped going to therapy I had accidentally just like kept the block going and so I decided this year I'm going to use that block to write so every Thursday morning during the time that I would have otherwise commuted to and from therapy and like gone to therapy that's my writing time I will not be answering Mm -hmm. work emails or slacks uh, I will just be writing, doing something related to writing. And I, I will say that has helped a lot. Yeah. So the yeah. structure is huge. The deadlines are huge. Us writers need to be kept in line. <laughs> so That's finding right. your structure is a huge piece of that, I feel like. Totally. I think like accountability is something mm-hmm. that really works for me. And so involving other people or waving some sort of carrot over myself like <laughs> a, a deadline for a contest like even sure. if it's even if it's not something that the odds are so against me or something or whatever just like having something to work towards and say like I'm going to spend a little bit of money on this so I need to make sure what I submit is ready or good mm-hmm. or whatever you know that that helps me. Yeah, no, that that 100% is the same thing for me. And it is helpful that a lot of them is not just like, you know, submit by this time. It's like there are specifications. So like when mm-hmm. we spent like a month working on our, our Warner Media applications that we both got rejected with, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you know, they had a lot of specifications, like, it, you know, you had to submit two samples, they had to be in the same genre, mm-hmm. and they had to be like the same length. So you couldn't submit like a 20 minute pilot and a, a you know, 40 minute pilot, you had to submit two. 40 or 220. And so, you know, both of us had uh, struggled <laughs> to do that because mm-hmm. we we yeah. are both very eclectic writers that tend to have That's a lot right. of different kinds of samples. And so that was a, a good thing because it taught me, okay, this is what's going to be expected now and in the future. So it's good for me to know like, all right, what the rules are. It's not just send me good writing. It's like, this is specifically what we're looking for. And yeah. um, that was very helpful to me. I guess we'll start with inspiration. It's, it's, it seems like it's a good place to, to start is like how to get inspired. And then when the roadblock of writer's block hits, how to get mm-hmm. over that. Maybe that's the structure of this episode. Sure. We're finding it as we're talking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so inspiration. Mm-hmm. I, the biggest thing that inspires me is going out and about, like what people watching, listening to people, especially Mm -hmm. if I can overhear someone say something really funny, then I have a character in my head from that. And so I try to go, it's obviously harder during COVID, but I try and go, you know, for a walk in a busy park where I can overhear some conversations or Just going out for a walk is good because like you get some fresh air, you get some scenery. Sometimes you see something really visual that just sparks a visual, like a frame in a film or a series. But that's my number one is like if I'm feeling like I need inspiration, I get out of the house. Interesting. Be where the people are as much (laughs) as I can. I want to be where the people are. Oh, that's right. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. And so you're you're obviously in good company with that. I think a lot of people find inspiration from like taking walks and like people watching and stuff. I don't. I like don't care what people around me are talking about. Like that's their <laughs> business. That's none of my business. Uh, I don't know. I've just I've always been like that. Like I don't find people people watching to be all that exciting. Mm-hmm. I like would rather be doing something else. So yeah, I will say that my big source of inspiration tends to be watching media, uh, you know, or consuming media of some kind, like narrative media specifically, Mm -hmm. um, and artistic media or discussing it. So like, one of my favorite things about my burn notice podcast is that it's actually very inspiring, because as we are like, unpacking what we have watched and like looking at the different story elements, I am inherently thinking like, okay, this is what like, like, this is why we loved this episode. So how can I reverse engineer that in my own writing, things like that, like the po- the pilot I'm working on right now is sort of like my take on what I wish the burn notice pilot had been with like my mm-hmm. own spin on it. 
So like right. taking what I liked about it and like I what I thought were like really strong elements and kind of like adapting. And like it's the same for all of my work. Like Brains was I had recently seen uh, Warm Bodies and uh, Zombie Land, and I was really enjoying zombie media. And I was just thinking like, you know, all of these distinct takes on zombies. What's my distinct take on zombies? And mm. then engineering a story based on that and then like uh my my current sample that you know got into stow and everything um dead on arrival that was basically okay i liked doing brains i want to do something that's still kind of lightly supernatural but not a full like world building supernatural so what are other supernatural elements ghosts okay i haven't seen a lot of ghost stuff but like I know, you know, I, I, I live in the world. I know that ghost media exists. So what's mm -hmm. my version of ghost media? You know, and then I, I kind of go from there. So I, I really do like taking what's already out there and like rearranging the puzzle pieces to make mm -hmm. my version of it and my take on it. So that's that's for me, that's, like my major source. That's cool. I think for me, like watching media does help, but it it has to be out because watching something just on my couch feels like the way that I decompress, you know, at the oh. end of a day. And so like being at festivals always inspires me. I always get a new idea when I'm out at a festival, mm -hmm. watching a whole bunch of things that are like really creative and really innovative. And I'm hearing the filmmakers talk about what they did or where the idea came from. That always sparks something for me. But just watching just doesn't do it. And that's why I think People watching, like I don't even necessarily need to overhear something or sometimes I get an idea that's totally unrelated to what I'm seeing or hearing. It's just mm -hmm. like be having a change of scenery mm -hmm. and not like sitting, staring at paper or a screen trying to come up with ideas. It's like just allowing myself to kind of daydream a little bit that sure. allows an idea to come. Yeah. That's, you know, what's funny is, so we'll, we'll probably talk about like the space and like the psychological ne necessity of being in a physically different space, which is, hey, why quarantine has sucked so bad for creative. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's funny you say that about like watching stuff at home isn't, it, it's not the same for you. And that's like, I just want to compliment you on like your incredible like psychological boundaries because I have like it's it's not <laughs> different for me like if I watch a movie at home versus like in a theater my attention span is slightly different but even when I'm watching at home like my brain is just like how do I do my version how do I work in this <laughs> industry oh god I'm never gonna make it blah you know like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if I'm consuming media of any kind I am working mm -hmm. and that's why like this year my whole thing has been like I need to find hobbies that are unrelated to something Thing I could potentially monetize like that's why I've liked painting so much no one's ever gonna pay me to paint and I kind of don't right. want them to I like having this pocket because unfortunately even vegging out to media I can't shut my brain off so mostly mm -hmm. I just wanted to say like congratulations for being <laughs> <laughs> a much psychologically healthier person than I am I am very jealous of you please continue with well, your line I of thinking <laughs> I think it's partly that I don't have many hobbies. So like sitting on my couch with my cats, cuddling, watching something is is like has, I have to make it not just work. Like it has sure. to be a thing I do to unplug too, you know. The thing I was going to say though is David Lynch, who I'm not a big fan of, he makes very interesting movies and some I like, some I don't like. But um, he had a phrase that I heard him use in an interview once where he said that Writing is like going fishing. In order to be a good writer, you have to set space and time to daydream and fish for ideas. And I thought that that was, that really resonated with me because I know a, lo a lot of people, Justin during the pandemic signed up for some like deal with masterclass. So I watched a whole bunch of masterclass sessions at the end of uh, last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I watch a bunch of writing ones and so many of them were like, when I need a new idea, I watch like historical documentaries or I research about like a place I want to write about or something. And that none of that resonated with me. But what he said resonated with me because that's where a lot of my ideas come from is just like sitting and being and daydreaming. And then like you like suddenly you catch something like mm -hmm. something just sort of clicks and then I'm running with it. And so I think that part of writer's block, which, you know, we'll talk more about kind of combating it, but part of that is like creating space, like literal time and space to just sit 
and not like think about your life, but just like daydream. Um, and that yeah. is, of course, a privilege that's not, you know, a lot of to everybody. But I think that, that that is something that I find is helpful to me is like blocking out time where I'm not going to force myself to write because that doesn't mm-hmm. work for me is to say like I need to write during these hours. But forcing myself to just be with my own mind. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. And I what I like, and I think this relates to something that I feel like Jerry said when we were doing a lunch and learn mm. last year, but like, may, I feel like it was Jerry. But anyways, somebody I was talking to, possibly friend of the pod, Jerry Maravia, <laughs> was about like, I, I think that an underrepresented part of the writing process is the part where you're not writing. And a big mm-hmm. piece of like, giving yourself a break and like allowing yourself to be your most creative is remembering that like just wandering around thinking about stuff counts as writing like literal time writing is not the only part of the writing process and giving yourself permission almost to just like feel creative and you know wander around or like lay somewhere or meditate or go fishing or go painting Mm -hmm. or whatever and just being in that moment can be exactly the spark that you need versus like forcing yourself to sit in front of a laptop and say right you idiot right otherwise you'll never make it that's not conducive to productive things (laughs) and that's also why I do like you know consuming other art because like seeing what somebody else has made and has cared about and spent time on like you know calms me to like oh yes I like doing this and I like seeing the results of it it's nice um my version of because I I don't go to as many film festivals as you do although I would like to someday my big like in-person art gathering is poetry slams. I haven't been to one in Mm. almost a decade now. But back in college, I got really into slam poetry uh, because it's very big in Portland, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I loved going to poetry slams and I love performing in them. But I love to just go and like listen, because I find poetry slams in particular are such a good combination of like performance and really concisely delivered art. I like mm-hmm. what I like what appeals to me about poetry slams is like no poem is longer than three or four minutes. So it's all very small. You have a very, you know, there's an economy of storytelling that happens inherently in poetry and in poetry that you're performing that I find very helpful because I'm a person who I don't know if you guys have noticed this on the podcast over explains things and talks too much. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion it might have to do with me being undiagnosed ADHD, but that's a that's a problem for my therapist. Um, <laughs> but like it is a problem that I have where I'm always over explaining I, I you know I, I I overwrite everything that I do but poetry forces you not to over explain or if you are going to over explain you make that part of the art but even so it's poetry it's not prose so your lines are shorter you have fewer words that have to make more of an impact and I just I find that a fascinating form and then that paired with like these very animated performances which are often mocked and considered cringeworthy you know are somebody just fully like being in the moment of whatever this poem is about and I I have never felt more inspired than just sitting there and listening to people you know it's it's almost like an open mic like I'm like a musical s- s- mm-hmm. moment you know music is a, a source of inspiration for many people and poetry for me and slam poetry performed poetry in particular kind of scratches a similar but more relatable to me itch because I don't understand music I you know mm-hmm. I can get swept up unconsciously by it but I don't really have a strong artistic connection to music beyond like it's nice to have music in the background that when I, while I'm writing but poetry it's words it's people talking mm-hmm. and explaining things it's people emoting and that I have always found to be something that like my creativity can bounce off of a lot more um easily so mm-hmm. yeah, I love poetry slams and I miss them dearly. It's unfortunate. There was, I, don't, I think, I believe it closed down. Yeah, it closed down. But when I would visit uh, Jerry in LA on two separate occasions years ago, there was this Wednesday night open mic thing. I can't remember what it was called, but it was really cool. It was like in this warehouse, like you wouldn't know that the upstairs is this kind of cool, small stage and seating mm-hmm. area. And it was run by this woman I think her name was Ariana Bosco, I'm pretty sure. And it was prim- It was like a very diverse room, primarily people of color. And Jerry would go like every Wednesday. And so the two times that I was there on a Wednesday, he brought me. And it was cool because people would do a lot of poetry, but some people would sing. It was just like a general open mic. And the woman who runs it, she would have a second round, essentially what she would call it, where she would like pick one line from someone's poem and one line from someone's song 
and then have them find a way to combine them into a combined set in the second round. Oh, that's round. so cool. So it's almost like yeah. art, artistic improv. Yeah. And so there was like, there was, I remember one time Jer- Jerry told me I wasn't there the night, but Jerry did like a, po- a poem for the first time. He actually um, spoke and then she had him do this one line and this other guy did a monologue and she picked a line from his and then she made them like scream the lines at each other just over and over. And it was, and he was like, it was really like uh, liberating because mm-hmm. it was like this two really powerful lines that were sort of opposing in a way. And mm-hmm. then she just like made, she made them keep getting more and more like angry and just scream it. And, uh, and he found it just really like a release of a lot of tension. Very cathartic. And, yeah. And the two times that I went, I left feeling very inspired because like the work was amazing, but then also to see this like weird like mixing of genres and Mm -hmm. emotions and artistries um and to walk out of that uh, and also to know that like I wouldn't even have the guts to do that Mm -hmm. (laughs) like I'm not a performing artist in that way and so it was just really inspiring and it's unfortunate because now that you're in LA it would be an amazing thing for you to go to but they closed down um that's so sad early last year Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's just like this level of earnestness to open mics and to festivals and stuff that you can't recreate many places because I think that, you know, and the reason that poetry slams are, you know, sort of derided and like cringed upon is because of the earnestness that I think makes them special. But like when you go to a place where people just want to express themselves and it's not about like who can express themselves in the most interesting, like societally acceptable way. It's just like, this is the thing that I do. Let me share it with you. There is something Mm -hmm. so touching and vulnerable about that that almost invites you and gives you permission to be open and vulnerable yourself because you know there's no level of irony we're not trying to mask anything it's just we're going to express ourselves right now and we're going to do it in a bunch of ways that you will probably never express yourself in but it kind of frees you from the restrictions of what we assume it means to be artistic correctly and i i really look forward to finding spaces like that again Mm -hmm. because boy howdy do we need them Mm -hmm. so what i just wanted to respond to something that you said earlier on about like structure is helpful for you and accountability is but like forcing yourself to sit down and say i will write right now is challenge is more challenging for you and for me because I am someone who is um, historically terrible at boundaries and who is historically terrible at like giving myself breaks and stuff and like doing just one thing at a time. I actually find that very liberating to, you know, my Thursday mornings where like I go to a coffee shop because I can do that again. There's a coffee mm-hmm. shop right across from me. It's amazing. Oh my God, being in a different <laughs> place is so helpful. But even when it's not, even when it's just like, this is the time of my day where I do this. For me, it's less about like forcing myself like, hey, idiot, be creative during this two hours. It's about like, hey, you finally get to be creative. I have given you permission and space. This is what you get to do. No one else needs your time. You are accountable only to you. Let's do something. And I find that very helpful because giving myself those these little pockets of like, this is the hour that I will write. It doesn't for me, at least because of the way that I am, (laughs) the way that I am, it it (laughs) feels like Oh, finally, like it feels like a relief to have this space. And even in times where I'm not feeling the most like inspired to write something new, I have also found that giving myself permission to use that time to do things that are like adjacent to writing, whether that's rewriting something, whether that's just doing like a character study, like I'm just going to have a conversation with my character in, you know, a screenplay format, like I'm just going to have literally have a dialogue between me and my characters, just to sort of feel it out. Sometimes it's rewriting, you know, my my personal statement, because I know that there's a deadline coming up. Sometimes it's researching upcoming deadlines, like as long as it is related to the act of writing, and to something I want to do with my writing, I consider that all in one encompassing thing where I'm being productive. Mm -hmm. I just might not always be writing new pages and I have to be okay with that. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it, you know, the way to get through hard times for me is to give myself permission to use this time however I want and not judge myself for how much of that time I am producing new work. As long as I am making progress for specifically my writing career then that is enough. And I will feel good at the end of that two hours. And I will feel refreshed and excited for next week. That's great. Yeah. I know that for me, psychologically, I'm a very competitive person. (laughs) And I try, I try to stifle that like, 
and I and I think just like therapy and just growing up and everything has made me a better like less competitive in terms of like I need to win against people like I don't right. I don't feel competitive with my peers I'm not like I need to win that award like that's not where it comes out but I do have this need to like prove I can do something when there's a challenge yep. and so I'm the when I need motivation or I need like a spark of inspiration I know that creating a challenge is the is the way to get me like get my wheels turning in Mm -hmm. my mind and that's really why I struggle without my weekly writers group because that's something we do every session Ryan Kramer and Kelsey Robert we met in a tv writing class and part of that class was we would have to pitch uh the first the first half of class every single class was everyone has to pitch a new idea and sometimes it was like an idea you had to come up with on the spot with specific parameters and so Sometimes I do that to myself where I either like come up with them myself or I look for a contest that has specific parameters and then I'm like, oh, okay, I, because I'm, I'm restricted, I can't go over this amount of pages and I have to be in one location or I have to use this prop or whatever mm-hmm. that like gets me suddenly feeling inspired because I'm trying to problem solve. And I think I just like mm-hmm. work well under pressure. That's just my general. And we're similar default. like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's why like the episode we just recorded that I think is two episodes ago for you all uh, about cheats was something that like we had a lot to talk about because it's yeah. like creative problem solving is one of the most fun parts of filmmaking and, and screenwriting yeah. is all right, I am limited. And instead of being resentful and defensive about my limitations, I'm going to use this as fuel to be even more creative. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's harder to do on my own because it's not as exciting when you like can't see other people's results, like to sure. see kind of laugh about how silly they are, or, like mm-hmm. be impressed by how amazing they are, you know, like it's not as fun to do on my own but that's why I look for contests sometimes but Mm -hmm. in our writing group we do a few different exercises one of them is that we do like a out of a hat kind of a thing where we write Mm. down three things a network a setting and uh, maybe a profession or a genre something like that and we have a bunch of them and we we either literally put them in a hat or we just do it through like a virtual way. But each of us picks one of each. So like I would maybe get, you know, free form as the network and uh, sci-fi as the genre and a farm as the, the location. Ooh. And I have 10 minutes to come up with a pitch for that network that's that genre and has that setting and then uh, and everyone has their own and then we pitch for the group. And sometimes I, I would always come up with like really fun, creative pitches that I, you know, wouldn't have ever thought to do otherwise. Mm-hmm. And and then from there, we all kind of sometimes we just laugh at them because they were like all really bizarre and out there. But mm-hmm. sometimes they're really good. And then we kind of have like a majority vote thing where it's like, OK, I challenge you to come in with pages for that next time. And if we all sort of agree that then that's the challenge for next week is to come in with pages or um, another one we would do is either we would each come in with a film pitch based on a headline of a news article Mm -hmm. or we would all come in with a news article and then swap. So then you have like 10 minutes to come up with an idea based on someone else's headline. I love this. Yeah. I I mean, (laughs) just being with other creative people and just you know, sparking something from totally random and be like, figure it out is so much fun to me. I mean, God, I want to be in a writer's room so bad because I love just coming (laughs) up with ideas. Like even you and I had a production meeting yesterday about like some podcast stuff and some breaking even stuff. And Mm -hmm. like we we had to keep stopping ourselves from just like coming up with more ideas because that was not necessary to the fulfillment of the meeting (laughs) agenda. But like I like just just going back and forth with people. Like one of the, the things that I used to do when I used to live with my frequent creative partner Christine Cherry was like I would accost her when she was coming out of the bathroom or something because we lived (laughs) together and I was like hey come sit with me on the couch for eight hours I want to just like work something out with you and we'll just talk and like you know sometimes we'll go in tangents or whatever but it's all around like I have this kernel of something can you help me spin it out and we Mm -hmm. just talk about the idea and about the story and about things that it reminds us of and then it gets us talking about like oh what we love about that thing that reminds us of it and so that's why I'm really like I I have leads on writers groups 
right now because like I really miss having that sense of creative community of just everyone just being open to talk about stuff and being open to just like let's see where this thread takes us let's see where this headline takes us let's see where this random you know out of a hat assignment takes us I love that I love even if it doesn't go anywhere it still leaves you feeling you know that serotonin rush of creating something together even if there's no end to it beyond the act of creating it yeah yeah I mean I I just I love having the writing group so much and it's usually just the three of us but we often will invite other people sometimes like a production company people we collaborate mm-hmm. with will ask to join or especially um like Ricardo who's an actor that I work with a lot he was writing a feature so for a good like four weeks or something he would join us to kind of help him break down his feature and give feedback on pages and stuff and so we're always like inviting people but it's not consistent like even before the pandemic we would always move the day around based on our schedules and so the bigger it gets the harder it gets yeah Um, that's always the challenge (laughs) yeah but I, I like the way that we do it. I don't think that I, I know a lot of writing groups where it's just like everyone brings in pages and you get feedback. And I mm-hmm. think that that is helpful. And we mm-hmm. also do that sometimes. But I like the like more collaborative way that we run it. It is sort of like a writer's room. Yeah, that's my, my fiance has had the same writer's room since he was in college. They were put together randomly as a thesis group because they all write like similarly-ish stuff, but they'd mm-hmm. never worked together before. And it's been almost a decade and they are still like regularly meeting every two weeks. Sometimes they don't have any pages and they just talk and they just use the time to like, you know, meet back up. Sometimes they have little challenges. Sometimes um, it's either like a creative challenge like write a micro short on this because he's a prose writer uh, but sometimes mm-hmm. the challenge is like submit to three literary magazines and tell us which ones they are next time you know and so the challenge mm-hmm. is finding new places to submit their work and sometimes developing new work and as a result and I, I've always admired and respected that that process so we actually um, before we move on from inspiration to writer's block we actually have a question from our audience Mike DeVore responded to my tweet about like hey thoughts on writer's block and inspiration Uh, So Mike DeVore says, I am inspired by past events in my life. However, as I develop my project, I find myself worried about legal ramifications, even if I were to change attributes of characters, thoughts, because uh, and I wanted to bring this up because I think that a lot of people find inspiration from their own lives, you know, write what you know, and all of that. And I have I have also had (laughs) conflicting feelings about okay, how much am I writing a, you know, a memoir? Or am like, what is the kernel? So like, what what has been your experience writing from like literal personal experience? So it's funny, because I think our next episode is with Kelsey Rauber, where we'll be talking about this. Mm -hmm, It is. She's a really good person to talk to, because almost everything she writes is from personal experience. And like, about a donkey is based on her real family, although Like, the mom is not her mom. Mm -hmm. It's a different person in her family. So she, like, mixed around quite a bit. Sure. But Kelsey, the web series is named after her. And it's, like, (laughs) the main character is based on her. And the friends are based on her friends. So I think she'll have more to say on that topic. Sure, sure, sure. The thing for me, because I write, like, metaphors a lot. Because I tend to work in fantastical genres, right? So, like, my, my literal trauma are, you know allegorical monsters you know so sure, like sure, sure, sure. that's that that is how I balance those things where it's like I am pulling from real life experience but I'm changing it's all subtext and sure. and what's actually on screen and what's actually being written is is more of like my feelings turned into a narrative mm-hmm. but yeah I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a good example or like I have much to speak to on that because I tend to use more like subtext and emotion is is what's what I'm really pulling from rather than like literal relationships or experiences. But I think that's actually good advice is like, even if you're not writing allegorical stuff, use the same principles of that. So like, if you know, a friend of yours inspires something, and you're like, Oh, I want to write something about that instead of just saying, All right, I'm gonna make my friend the character take what about their behavior. 
behavior, their decisions, whatever that inspired you and put it in a new setting. So like really be honest with yourself. Like, is it, I want to write, you know, a (laughs) documentary drama essentially about my friend, Mm -hmm. or is it, this was a really interesting concept and I'm going to see where that takes me divorced from its original context. Because Mm -hmm. I am somebody who like, so my senior thesis in college was I wrote an epistolary novel where I took, it was written in a series of blog posts and emails and stuff like that. Like it was a technological epistolary novel. And one of the main conceits is the main character who is based on literally me as a high schooler had a public blog that like everyone in her life knew about and a private blog that she kept under a pseudonym. And I was always like, oh, I would love to do this someday. And I'm like, I don't have time to write my real blog, let alone a fake one. (laughs) But so I took actual blog posts that I was posting at the time that the situation that I was writing about took place. So for me, it was a great exercise. I can't do anything with that (laughs) story until Mm -hmm. I fully change it. Because like, I basically just had people, real people doing the real things that they did, you know, in slight and slightly heightened ways. And I just like changed their name. But the actual circumstances were the same, much of like the jobs were the same and like their mm-hmm. position in my life. There's no way that that's going to be okay. Like, you know, it's full character assassination. It was very cathartic right. to write. Um, and some of it was quite good. But like, you know, I got to be realistic about myself. That was cathartic. It was not potentially productive for a thing I will actually get published. So if I were to return to that, though, like the core premise of like having a very public digital life and having a very private one at the same time, and like the dichotomy of what has changed about that, that I would keep. And the core mm-hmm. of like the kinds of things that character and myself were struggling with at the time, you know, about like, identity and like, you know, fundamental truths about your life that suddenly weren't fundamental truths anymore and having to like Mm -hmm. reconcile who you are that can stay but like you know the literal experience of my parents getting divorced and the circumstances surrounding that maybe not relevant (laughs) you know maybe it doesn't have to be a divorce thing necessarily but you know there could be a conflict with the parents that is different but like it wasn't that my parents were getting divorced that is the interesting thing it's the emotional impact of my parents' divorce on like who I was at the time and my like identity renegotiation as a result of learning new things about my parents. That was what the core of that story was. So if I was going to re-explore that in a way that would not get me immediately sued or disowned, <laughs> mm-hmm. I would take the emotional core and put it in new context. So I would I would invite you if it's not like you just need to get this down and like feel good Mm -hmm. on the page, that's fine. A lot of times, you know, in similar ways, like writing something that you'll never do anything with because it felt good to write and it felt like you needed to, that's fine. Give yourself permission to do that. But if you are really trying to develop something to produce or to, you know, go somewhere with, do exactly what Christina does. (laughs) But instead of, you know, making the experience of something into like the metaphor for zombies, make it just take the emotional core and put it in a new context. That's right. I think it's, with everything, I before you go into making something or really like breaking it down and putting effort into it, I think asking yourself why it is that you want to write this specific mm-hmm. thing or make this specific thing. The why is important. Yeah, like what are you trying to explore or get across? And that will help you figure out what actually needs to be from real life and what, you know, what you're really, what can accomplish that in another way. Yeah. And like, uh, like we said, we're definitely going to be exploring that in even more detail next episode. So uh, tune in to that one. Um, okay, so we're inspired now and we're, we're trucking along. And then it happens. The writer's mm-hmm. block. Um, so what is what is your experience uh, and or most common experience maybe with writer's block, Christina? When do you get writer's block? What was a particularly terrible period of it? Other like pandemic aside like obviously the pandemic is like yeah, a n- international <laughs> traumatic event that all of us experience but like ordin- a writer's blog technically existed before that so like what is your experience yeah, been yeah. with it i mean i tend to have a hard time writing uh, when it's cold out and i am hmm. stuck in my apartment more so i know that for instance i was not writing for quite a while in 2016 for some reason i don't Or maybe it was 2015. I was making stuff, but I hadn't written. Like that was sort of a, there was a gap because in 2015, I made three things with Kelsey where I just directed and she was the writer and I hadn't Mm. written anything in quite a while. And for whatever reason, I was just like not feeling inspired and not coming up with anything new. And then 
for Thanksgiving, we went upstate to visit my husband's family. And there was a weird moment where we were on the road and someone pointed at our car and then they drove off and we were like, what the hell? And then we smelled rubber, like burning rubber. So then Justin pulled over and got out and looked and there was nothing weird. We didn't really understand what had happened, but in the moment of him like getting out and looking at the car, I suddenly became very aware of how just like creepy it was that we were in like upstate where there weren't a lot of people around. It was nighttime, there was snow and Christmas music was playing on the radio. (laughs) But like, it was really creepy. And that weird juxtaposition is what then made me like, we got home that night and Silent Night, which Mm -hmm. is a feature I've been revising ever since, just poured out of me. I wrote the whole first draft that night. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was like, obviously this weird experience, but just like being out of my apartment and having new surroundings to be inspired by really kicked it off for me because I had been, it was, oh, 2015 was also the year that I quit my previous job that involved a lot of travel. And it was before I started working at Seed and Spark. And so it was me spending a lot of time at home. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wait, like constantly, I wasn't traveling suddenly. I was just like in my small apartment. This is when we lived in a really tiny shoebox apartment too. And so for like nearly, for a good like six months, I was just like in this apartment with nothing new. Mm -hmm. And so that, that I think is a time where I definitely stands out to me where I had like real serious writer's block. And it was kind of the things that I talked about earlier, like finding inspiration. That was the thing that kicked it off for me. It was like getting out of my usual surroundings and having like a new experience Mm -hmm. to spark an idea. I mean, that sounds like an identical experience that I had in 2017. 2017 was one of truly the worst years of my life. It was just a lot of stuff was happening. It was a a big year of transitions, too. Like, I had just been laid off, essentially, from MTV, where I was, like, not happy anyways. But, you know, having that steady paycheck was very helpful. We had just moved Mm -hmm. into a new apartment, and it was our my Quinn and I's first time living alone. So we were in a brand new apartment. I had just lost my job, so I was at home all the time. But instead of having roommates around to, like, you know, yell at or whatever, it was just me just, like, wandering around my new apartment that, like, we couldn't afford much furniture for, which was kind of depressing. And I just, like, I was like, okay, I have to use this time to apply for work and also be very creative, you know? And it's, like, the Mm -hmm. imposition of, like, well, now I have this time why aren't I being productive and it took me most of the year of just sort of like doing these very self-indulgent like annoying things that didn't work out because I was like trying to riff on the fact that I couldn't create anything and I was like well that'll be the thing I create riffing on not being able to create things worst idea ever most cliche idea ever it didn't work for good reason and then I was like I had a new job finally and I wasn't like super happy at it but like I was just at the office or at the co-working space technically that we were working out of (laughs) I'm being coy but everyone knows where I was working and (laughs) I was like sitting there and I didn't have a lot to do that day and I was thinking about how depressed I was (laughs) And I was sort of missing something that I used to do with Chris, actually, Christine Cherry, when we did live together. Like I was I wasn't missing roommates necessarily, but I was missing having sort of constant access to people who were sort of just around all day um, Mm -hmm. if I wanted to interact. And there was a period of time the year before where we were both in therapy and had it on the same day and we would both get home from therapy and talk about therapy. And I just remember, I was just like thinking about that very fondly and how like weird it was to have sort of almost a second therapy session for both of us because we had to decompress from our previous therapy. And I found myself and I remembered like a topic of one of those, those sessions. And obviously everyone knows where I'm going with this now, but (laughs) you know, there was a, there was a very funny moment where Chris had mentioned to me that she was worried that she was depressing her therapist because Mm -hmm. she, at the time, like every story she told ended with something very sad. And even though it was like a fun story usually leading up to it there would just be like this crashing like you know final moment and you're like why are you telling this story (laughs) and what now that she was in therapy for the first time she was like hearing it out loud in a whole new context and so like I just always found that concept very funny like I'm depressing my therapist whose whole job is to listen to depressing things and so I wrote this sort of like slightly heightened fictionalized version of that conversation and then I just kept writing and so many people know because I've talked about it a lot in behind the scenes stuff 
stuff, but Sam and Pat are depressed. My, uh, my most recent web series was written. The first season was written in a single day. Like I basically, I wrote that first episode and then I was like, well, there's other topics within this. And I find our heightened versions of ourselves very funny. And I like, I spent the next 15 hours writing the entire first season. I instantly emailed it to Chris. She read it and she was like, holy shit, we, I don't even think I changed that much. This is the only script that I've ever written that was not rewritten basically at all. There were like a couple of small changes that we made just for like production reasons. And because there was like a, like Chris had found a punch up moment, but like that first season, it just sort of poured out of me fully formed. And within a month we had shot the entire series. And it was one of those moments where I was like, I was feeling bad for myself, but I was finally not like forcing myself to do anything. And then all of a sudden it hit me. And I, you know, I think it's sort of like dating in that way where, you know, I met Quinn at a time in my life where I was like resigned to be alone forever <laughs> instead of like actively <laughs> trying to date. I was just like, ah, I'm not, I don't need to date anymore. I'll just have fun and flirt with people and be unattached. <laughs> oh, hello. Most serious relationship of my life instantly. And I, I think it's <laughs> true for writing too, is, you know, sometimes we are, our terror over like not having a thing or a new thing or doing something mm -hmm. can prevent us from being open to, you know, new ideas. And I think a lot of writer's block comes from like overthinking the fact that we have mm -hmm. writer's block. And sometimes it's just about like accepting that that's where you're at, going about your life with other things and trusting that the world will give you something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will say one thing that I got from, and I haven't, I haven't actually done this myself, but it, I found it to be an interesting piece of advice <laughs> from Shonda Rhimes from a, one of the master class episodes I watched her too. she did. Yeah. I, I thought I, what I think is interesting from like a writing perspective is, you know, if you're trying to write like features or, or shorts or just writing to write, like to be creative and because you love writing, then trusting that a spark will come works. But if you're like a writer for hire, like you're a TV mm -hmm. writer and you just like need to be able to write no matter how you're feeling, no matter sure. what's going on in your life, then training yourself to write is like part of that job is part of, you know, getting good at that job. Mm -hmm. And so a piece of advice that she had, because she is so busy, she said that like, while some people can do what you've been doing, Brie, which is like designate a specific time of a day and like that's when you write she can't do that because she's like in meetings constantly she's mm -hmm. a mom she has a bunch of shit going on and so she was like what i try to do is is create i created like a pavlovian sort of trick where it's like a thing that i usually do while writing at the time that i'm used to writing that i like to write i don't do it outside of writing and then whenever I do that thing, I suddenly can write. And so her example was blasting music in headphones, like big cupping headphones. Mm -hmm. um, she was like, if I blast music into my ears with those headphones, I know that I can just like start typing no matter where I am, what time of day it is. And so I thought that was an interesting piece of advice. And I, I started experimenting with it a little bit, like with the specific tea that I would often I drink was wondering if it was going to be related to tea. I don't know why, but I was like, I wonder if she's <laughs> going to say, this is the kind of tea I drink when I write. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, uh, I, I was trying that out for a while with specifically chai with masala chai. And it, it, it works, but it's also like, I mean, it works to some degree, but it, it's, I'm, I haven't done it consistently because sometimes I just want chai. So Right. And that's like... the trouble. For me, like I actually, that did used to be my big trick. And then the pandemic ha happened and like, I was just useless because my trick was I would get up <laughs> early on a weekend usually um, and I would go to a coffee shop and I would get breakfast and I would, you know, have a little bit of a morning while I was eating my breakfast and drinking my coffee. And then I wouldn't take my charger. I would just take my laptop. So I had limited time. That's what I write. And it was like, it was magical how easily I was able to do that. And it wasn't and like coffee to an extent is kind of a Pavlovian response for me, although like that has atrophied quite a bit during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like mm -hmm. being in a coffee shop, having my headphones in, having limited time because my laptop could run out of charge like at any moment. And also like I know that I'll have less time to write if I'm harder on my laptop during my like little breakfast session. So like I have to be very careful and conservationalist about it. That's when I write and I then I go home and I do whatever else I want. But like, that's the time. And sometimes I will be inspired enough that like my laptop will run out of charge. I'll run home and keep writing. And those are like the best days, obviously. But yeah, I, I agree with her advice. 
and it definitely used to work for me when I was allowed to leave my apartment. And I'm trying to re-enter that into my 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 time. Although, you know, I'm in LA and the Delta and Gamma variants are running wild. I'm vaccinated, but you know, who knows what these fools are putting into our airstream now. So, you know, I got to be <laughs> right. careful, but that definitely is something that I, I have found is helpful. Yeah, that was the same for me too, actually. Something, what, I have a hard time writing at home because it's so mm-hmm. quiet, yeah. but music, music doesn't always work for me because the tone of the music, if it doesn't work with what I'm writing, it throws me off. And you got to make playlists. I, write, I know, but because I write like mixed genre things where it's like, this is a funny scene and a creepy thing, you know, like it's, it's hard to say what's going to work for that. And so I, I have a hard time with music, but then sometimes I'm just like too quiet in my apartment and I would love to go to cafes and just like be surrounded by noise and then be able to like zero in on what is in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I haven't been able to do that yet at all in the last year and a half. It's Oh so. my God, I miss it so much. Yeah, actually, no, you saying that though reminds me that I do try to, especially when I'm writing something particularly like different from my day to day life is I try to make um, playlists. So like for my my pilot that is good that I wrote this year, not my boring one that I'm currently working on, which I kind of have some writer's block on right now, to be honest, maybe I should do this because so anyway, so so the pilot that I wrote earlier this year was inspired by my best friend and I's childhood detective agency. And it didn't go anywhere in real life. But like we had all these like very lofty visions of it. And so I, I developed a story based on if we had taken it a little more seriously became estranged and like we're out of contact and then my character moves back home sort of in disgrace having like failed at being away from this terrible small town and us having to like reconcile our friendship at the same time as reinvigorating our childhood detective agency I was like this sounds very fun and so I made a playlist uh, for that pilot where it's a bunch of songs that I listened to in high school and so I put Mm -hmm. myself because like you know I I think I talked about in two episodes ago that like music isn't or maybe I talked about it earlier in this episode who knows music isn't like I'm not Mm -hmm. a music person I do like music but like you know I don't have a sophisticated understanding of it but I am a very much a like a sense memory person so you know if I smell a certain thing it'll remind me Mm -hmm. of like the first time or the most important time that I smelled that thing and it's the same is true for music and I certainly don't listen to most of the music I listened to in high school anymore but a lot of it's still in my iTunes so I made myself a playlist of stuff that like instantly puts me back in that mode. And that was a actually very effective sort of psychological trick for myself to put myself in the sort of vibe of, oh God, what if I had to be like in high school again? It didn't hurt that I was also for a lot of this writing process literally in my hometown. Although thankfully Mm -hmm. through therapy and distance away, (laughs) you know, I'm in a better place when I'm there now. Also, I'm an adult and I can drink here and that makes it a lot easier to be in my terrible hometown. But yeah, that was that was kind of how I put myself in the mode for that. And so maybe maybe the trick for the writer's block I'm currently experiencing with like, I've got the plot all down. And now I just need to make it an interesting story to read around the plot that I find very interesting. Maybe I need to figure out what the playlist vibe is so that I can kind of put myself in the the moment of this this piece and feel enveloped because I think that's the problem with my pilot right now is I don't have a good sense of space. Base. I don't have a good sense of like the world because like the actual like location isn't sort of super relevant. It's a, it's a very character driven plot. So like the space mm-hmm. doesn't feel real yet. And I, I think that's mm-hmm. what's making it hard to develop kind of the local color that you need, especially if you are in, you know, you're not just in New York. Like New York has like mm-hmm. a very this just feels like New York kind of a vibe, but like this town is fully fictional. And like, I had to recreate some stuff to like make the plot work. But as a result, it's just sort of this hazy fog (laughs) of, you know, what is, what is this place? It's just, you know, people floating around having interactions, but I don't know where they are. So yeah, as I'm talking, I'm like, Hmm, maybe I should do some stuff with that. (laughs) The problem is that I like my music, hasn't changed since middle school basically like I listened I listened to primarily in high school I listened to early 2000s R&B and early 90s grunge and like that was it and that's still kind of all I listened to (laughs) um and then like some like Bollywood or soca Caribbean soca music mixed in which is all still from the same like high school middle school period that's funny so I wouldn't be able to 
put on nostalgic music and have it feel nostalgic. It would just feel like, oh, I listened to this playlist in the shower two days ago. Yeah, I don't know. I I find like noise, noise that I can't like register is is easier for me because especially music that has lyrics, like I'm just going to want to sing along to the lyrics in my head. Yeah, I can't listen to new music when I'm when I'm writing. It has to be either music that I know so well that it's basically just like instrumental Mm -hmm. or truly instrumental like uh remember vitamin string quartet i don't know if they're still doing stuff but vitamin string quartet was a big thing for me in high school when i was writing because i could listen to my favorite songs but because it was just a string quartet cover of a song there was obviously no lyrics so i could get the same like energy that i liked from a song that i loved without the impulse to sing it because the like it was just you know violins or whatever so that was that was my thing. Also, I will say like soundtracks was very helpful when I was writing my most recent horror movie when I was writing buy in uh, or my side of buy in. I downloaded the Stranger Things soundtrack because it's very mm. atmospheric and creepy. And even though like the actual tone of both of the pieces was very different, because I'd never really written a true horror story, I found that like, just surrounding myself with sort of the music scape of a, a, a grounded horror was very helpful. Yeah, I it does work. It works when I'm writing genre in particular. It always, sometimes it gets weird when I'm writing like something funny in within a genre piece. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that quite works. Like yeah, that's hard for spooky and silly. You know, like there isn't this. The blend doesn't quite work musically. So we have another question, actually, from our wonderful editor, Ezra. Ezra asked us a question like six months ago, and we were like, we're going to do this episode probably. (laughs) So sorry for the wait, Ezra. (laughs) But Ezra says, I feel like my writer's block comes from when I feel as though there's no purpose or reason behind what I'm writing. How do you remind yourself to keep going? Yeah, I, what I said earlier, asking yourself why, I think can be really helpful. Like, well, Mm -hmm. why do I, why is this important to begin with? Like, why do I want to write this? Because sometimes I start writing something and then I'm like, well, I actually, I'm not that interested in this. So it's okay <laughs> that I don't finish it or that I, it doesn't go anywhere. Maybe right. it's just like an exercise in getting something on the page. Or proving that it does or doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, right. great. I don't have to finish it. Now I know. Right. Right. But if it is something that you genuinely see a purpose behind, having that real conversation with yourself about the why I think can push you. But I know for me... Again, going back to my writer's group, bringing other people's perspectives in, that helps me. That motivates me because if Mm -hmm. someone else gets really excited about it or someone else, it just like resonates with them because they're like, oh, that like I would love to see that. I haven't seen that anywhere. Then that pushes me like, okay, this has there's reason behind this. And so I think that getting outside of your own head, because obviously like imposter syndrome and sure. I'm just generally, you know, feeling like over something because you've been working, trying to, you know, workshop it for so long. I think all those things can kick in and make you second guess something that's actually really worthwhile. And so involving other people, um, even if it's like throwing the log line up on Twitter and saying, you know, does this sound interesting to people? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking for motivation and, and you'll find some good responses probably. I also find that like working on something else is helpful. Like the, the pilot that I was just talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. (laughs) Because yeah. So the pilot that I, the one about my best friend and I is mystery solving, um, you know, our detective agency, our fake detective agency. I have been kicking that around for years and I tried to write it once and it was just awful. It was so bad. And then I also tried to do a, 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 a creative exercise again with the character kind of vibe without the mystery element. Like I tried to do a show about, you know, estranged best friends reconnecting in adulthood and, you know, reconciling their identities as they were as children and as they were now. And that also awful, terrible. And so then I went and wrote a bunch of other things. And then finally sort of through the osmosis of being alive, finally found the combination of elements that I wanted And that script actually came out pretty quickly as well. Like it's, it's when you find that spark, it's like, no, I know exactly where I'm going now, but sometimes it takes a while. So moving on first and then returning can often be a very helpful exercise. Yeah. That's what I was going to say that I have a tendency to procrastinate, especially when something feels like work, like I'm supposed to do it. Yeah. And so sometimes if you make one script feel like work, then the other script is like fun. It's like, you know, it's like you're not you're, what you're not supposed to be doing. Like you're sort of cheating on one script with the mm-hmm. other. And so if you can kind of like bounce back and forth that way where it's like, okay, I've, 
I'm going to go revise this one because I'm, I, I'm supposed to be doing that one, but I'm going to do this one instead. And then you can like swap them as needed or bring in a third one or a fourth one, you know? And so that sometimes helps me. Yeah, I think that's smart. I also, for me, like outlining has been something that I avoided for a really long time and then got very into and then avoided again. <laughs> like me and outlining, we're constantly at odds because there's like, my personality as a human is like a perfect split between type A type B, you know, and it's it's very mm -hmm. much like my parents. Unfortunately, I am the true 50 50 of them. And it is a nightmare to be in my brain because sometimes I'm like, just let it happen. Just be artistic mm -hmm. and feel it out. Just see where it goes. And the other part of me is like, you have to have a super strict structure. Otherwise, you are a failure in every element of your life. <laughs> and that's hard. But I have found certainly with like, now that I'm writing more mysteries, because I really do love writing mysteries, outlining is vital, because you need to know what the clues are, and you need to know what scenes mm -hmm. clues are discovered in. And so and this has also been true before I did mysteries, where forcing myself to before I get to start writing and do the fun stuff before I get to do the type B, just like, let's explore the space, I have to actually <laughs> write down like I'm not allowed to write anything other than maybe like the first scene just to kind of get myself in the mood. Um, I have to write an outline, I have to know at at some point, like how we get from scene to scene. And um, especially in like, television writing outlines are like kind of mandatory because once you've written mm -hmm. something it's a lot harder to rewrite it and restructure things but it's super easy to edit an outline so going from mm -hmm. outline to workshopping the outline rewriting the outline to then putting it on page like you've already kind of done the hard stuff because a lot of writer's block comes from where the hell do I go with this Mm -hmm. and once you're in a scene and you know where what the goal is, you can finish it. It might be bad. That's my current situation as I wrote an outline that I feel pretty good about. But the actual scenes are sort of like, eh, some of them are good. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are just like, well, that got the job done. But that's easier to do on a writing stage of like, all right, let's now take what's getting the job done and make it more fun. But without the outline, I would never have gotten there because I would have been in the middle of a scene where I'm like, eh, and without a destination for it. I probably wouldn't have finished it. So having an outline right. can also be very helpful, I find, structurally and inspirationally. Yeah, I think it's knowing what kind of a writer you are. And and like, for instance, I don't really like out outlining and I very rarely do because I'm like a marathon writer in the sense mm. that I tend to finish things in one sitting, but I will kick it around in my head for like a month. And then you're kind of doing a, a brain outline. Exactly. So I do a brain outline and I tend to just jot like beats. So I beat sheets are my friend. Like that's what I'm all about is like knowing what beats I need to hit and knowing where I'm going. And once I know my ending, then I just sit down and I have to just like write it. Kelsey and Ryan, because we like see each other's work so much, they're sort of on opposite ends. Like I'm in the middle in the sense that I do beat sheet and I do have to outline it pretty extensively in my head. But like I can't start typing until I'm just like writing the script. Right. Um, Kelsey, she just like has an idea and then two hours later has an entire feature. And like <laughs> her whole thing is that she doesn't know where it's going. Like she doesn't know the ending. And then she writes this like really cohesive thing. <laughs> she has very weird, fun choices, but her whole thing is like revising. She revises mm. it to make it work as like, actual some structure mm -hmm. you know but she just like spits it out onto the page because she gets really bored by the idea if she knows exactly where it's going before writing that's interesting it. and that's i've definitely had that experience and then i assume ryan is like ryan hyper structured yes he's hyper structured he gets like paralyzed by one line if he doesn't know what he want where he wants to go with it or mm -hmm. what he wants the next scene to be so like he literally cannot start writing until he has dissected every little piece of it and it's also funny because if you read their like first drafts Kelsey will have like no screen direction whatsoever because she's just trying to be like okay they're in this room now here's the, all the dialogue and mm -hmm. the stuff that happens and like Ryan will just 
excessively describe what the space is like. And Mm -hmm. I think they both sort of try and work towards the middle because that's generally where you want to be. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably closer to the Ryan side of it than the Kelsey side of it. But I also think that I'm very middle ground because like when I when I say outline, I might mean beat sheet. Who knows? All these words, Mm -hmm. it's just semantics. But like for me, I just like I kind of just need to know, like generally speaking, where everyone is on a scene to scene level because Mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll write down like snippets of dialogue and things like that. And it'll be more of just like, it's my way of like being excited about where we're going and like getting from Mm -hmm. place to place without having to actually be in the scenes because that can take me a little longer. I'm a fast writer, but like when I'm in a scene, sometimes like I'll branch off and I'll be like, wait, nope, that doesn't make sense. I got to go back. I got to delete this part of the Mm -hmm. conversation and get us back on track. But I need to know where that track is, you know? So like I, there, there, for me, it's, there's still discovery of being in the scene and figuring out exactly Mm -hmm. how we're going to get to that next point. But I need to know what the next point is. Otherwise I like, I can also be paralyzed by a single line. And I have done that Mm -hmm. where I like a a script is abandoned in like the middle of a conversation. Cause I'm like, I don't know what direction, you know, they're, two roads diverged and then became 18 roads. And now I don't know where I'm going anymore. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, I, I need something, but you know, how detailed it is very much depends on like what I'm writing, because I also, I feel the Kelsey impulse of like, Oh, this is a really fun idea. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll have a fun idea and write as much of it as comes out of me. And then I will Mm -hmm. go back and outline the rest. So like once like the well dries up from just like the initial spark, I'll be like, okay, taking a step back. What's working right now? What do I like about this? Where would I want this to go next? And then I'll do that in outline and then I'll go back to the drafting phase. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like Game Brunch, my latest short that has been released by this point, that was something where I was just like, okay, I know what the twist is. Let me just start writing and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And it's like really silly, but a lot of fun. And I and I I would not have followed through with writing that if I had like outlined. Because I've been like, mm-hmm. this is so outlandish. Like, I don't feel the impulse to write it. I only feel the impulse to write it because I have this like spark that needs to get on the page. Right That's the, That was the same for Ace and Anxious. Buy-in, I think we had a little bit more of an outline just because two of us were writing it and we needed to be on the same page literally and figuratively. But yeah, for Ace and Anxious, I think it was just like, I was having a lot of feelings about like having just come out as asexual. I was having a lot of feelings about like all of a sudden my panic attacks were back, but like from nowhere because I was actually having a pretty good year when I wrote Ace and Anxious and so I'm like what's happening everything is so confusing and so I was like all right what would be a funny way out of this so the spark for that idea is like I was thinking about my asexuality and wanting to write something about it because I'd never seen that before if you've been Mm -hmm. to any event I've talked about this a lot uh but also like I had this equally important thing in my life of I am feeling anxious all of the time for absolutely no reason that's so irritating and not for nothing but like brains a lot of brains was about like trying to you know hack your brain and psychology into doing something like brains was predicated on like how funny is it that this neuroscientist is trying to use psychology to make people fall in love with her instead of just like being a good person and so I used a lot of the research from brains to like apply to to anxiety and so I was like all right well sex helps with anxiety (laughs) well, that's a bummer because I'm asexual. And then I was like, ha, there it is. And then I just, (laughs) I just wrote it from there. I'm like, okay, it's an asexual person trying to cure her anxiety and discovering that sex might be a valid way to do that. And that obviously not making sense. So like, what would she do? Mm -hmm. Maybe she'd, she'd interview some men to see if they'll have sex with her to test the scientific theory. Because I love women who do insane things for the science of it, um, especially who aren't like real scientists. And then yeah, I think that just came out. I think Ace and H just got rewritten a couple of times because I wasn't sure if I wanted to do like true chronology, split chronology. So I had written, I think, all the scenes and then I kind of rearranged them like puzzle pieces and to build the arc of what eventually became the film. But I, yeah, I don't think mm-hmm. I outlined that at all. I think it was the initial spark and then, okay, let's see what this girl's going to do. And then we'll we'll walk it back once I've seen her do it and see what the lo- most artistic way to present this crazy idea that she's got uh, will be. Cool. Yeah. Well, I that's all I have. <laughs> any any final yeah, thoughts on inspiration, on writer's block, on, on things you want to tell? I don't think anyone else has tweeted at us. So unfortunately, we have nothing else going for us there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like we covered a lot. I think it's, you know, part of it is finding what works for you and then finding some structure that works within that. You know, for me, it's like having... 
finding structure without structure is what works for me, right? So it's like, you know, I don't, I can't force myself to write during, during a designated time, but I can force myself to go out and find inspiration in the ways I know I find inspiration during that designated time, you know? Totally. So I think, I think it's really just like knowing yourself, learning about yourself and, and uh, not being afraid to involve other people because sometimes just talking it out will get you excited again or totally. get you feeling inspired again. Or will it, like it, make it clear, oh, maybe I don't want to do this. Like sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, I would I would drag Chris into the, the living room and we'd start talking and I'd realize, oh, you're right. There's nothing here. So instead of torturing myself to try and continue with this thing that isn't working, I'll try something new. And, you know, sometimes that's just as valuable. So don't get hard on yourself for not, you know, completing everything you start. That's not how the creative process works. Just be patient, be open to the world around you and find what works for you and lean into it. All right. Thanks so much to Kelsey Rauber for our theme music, Kaylee Brown for our podcast art, Ezra Lee for editing this episode, and to all of you for listening. Links to learn more about them are in our episode description. And thank you to our booby VIPs who are $10 patrons on Patreon. Amanda Blunt, Anthony Epp, Shannon Sprangler, Jules Piggott, Rain Bernal, Kelsey Rauber, Jerry Maravia, Norman Steinberg, and Shana Rose Woolley. If you would like a name shout out at the end of every episode, please feel free to subscribe at patreon.com slash breaking out pod so we can finally break even in making this podcast and continue to do even more complex weird creative things with it we love making this podcast and unfortunately we live in a capitalist society so if you want deeper dives into what we're doing and to help us do even more with the free stuff that we're doing patreon.com slash breaking out pod is the place to uh get involved and also remember to rate us five stars on your favorite podcast app if you haven't already and going the extra step to write a review instead of just putting five stars goes actually a really long way and we really appreciate it so thank you to all of you for who have already done that and thank you in advance to those of you who are about to do it right now next episode as we kind of already talked about we will be joined again by musician and writer kelsey rauber to talk all about writing from personal experience while still respecting the boundaries of your partner and loved ones so we already know one person who's going to be very interested in that conversation but i imagine Mm -hmm. it has a lot of applications for a lot of our listeners so be sure to tune in